almost 200 articles on constitutional issues, legislative issues, how they apply to the Constitution. And everything that I do and everything that I teach is not my opinion. I teach from the words of the founders of this nation. Um, how many of you heard the presentation that I gave last night? The book that I was Thank reading, you. I need to get with Sheriff Mack, and he needs to teach me how to be a better businesswoman. I'm not a businesswoman. I'm a content person. My husband handles all that stuff. But this is the book that I was reading from last night. This is a book that I've written and I have available today. This is actually a book that, we wrote, that I wrote uh, to be a tool for parents to help teach their students the truth about the foundation of this nation uh, because they're not getting that in the government schools and they're not getting it in the private schools either. You have to know that the same textbooks that are used to create government school curriculum are used to create private school curriculums. They're made in the same textbook factories with the same, same uh, teachers and professors that were taught in the same systems. So you get the same corruption of history in your private school curriculums that you do in your public school curriculums. So here we go, are you ready to blast off? How many of you realize that all three branches of government have failed the Constitution? Okay. But well, we won't spend a lot of time there because I gave you several examples last night. Your federal government is broken. There is no recourse left in the federal government. When was the last time you wrote your congressman and got the same letter that 250,000 other people got? If you got anything at all. I bet, I bet a Sheriff Mack writes his congressman, he never even gets a reply because I, they have a blackout list. If your name is on the blackout list, you can write them 400 times and they will never reply to you. My, my Florida representative will not even respond to my emails. So when the federal government fails, the states are left to defend the republic. If your states refuse to defend the republic, you have to. See, it's sort of like a chain of command. Not really, because you have more authority than the, fe than the state and the federal government does, but nonetheless, that's how it works. Let me ask you something really quick. Who has more power in your county? The sheriff or the president of the United States? Who has more power in your county? The sheriff or your congressman? Who has more power in your county? The sheriff or your state uh, senator? The sheriff. Who has more power in your county? Your sheriff or your governor? So where should you be focusing all of your attention? Yet here we are in, in, a, in a world, in a country where we spend billions of dollars on national elections. People by and large only show up to vote in national elections. And you get a very small percentage of people who actually vote in local elections. All your power is there. Let me tell you something. When I teach the history, our forefathers identified what they called a malignant and pernicious design in 1641. A malignant and pernicious design that tyrants used that they saw over 600 years prior to their discovery of this malignant and pernicious design that tyrants used to subvert liberty. Are you interested in knowing what the malignant and pernicious design was in 1641? Corruption of the court system. Infiltration of foreign law. Diminishing property rights of the people. The government inserting itself in the church. Manipulation of the monetary system and the government disarming the people while the government remained unlawfully armed. I'm sure glad we don't have those problems today. That was the malignant and pernicious design as identified in 1641. Your local elections are your only solution. Stop being intoxicated by the federal elections. That's what they're there for. We had just inaugurated a king in January, right? And at his inauguration, we were already talking about the 2016 presidential election. Which, by the way, I'll insert my opinion for just a second. Stop looking at Marco Rubio. Amen. 
Marco Rubio is an enemy to this Constitution, and if you haven't figured that out, come talk to me later. If you want to understand the proper role of your state, the proper role of your local government, we've got to get back to some basics, some things that have not been taught for decades. How many of you have heard of the Lee Resolution? The Lee Resolution was the legislative action that gave authority for the Declaration of Independence. Unlike history portrayed in, in movies, they didn't just all get uh, have too much beer and fish and chips the night before, wake up, get ticked off at the king, and go sign the Declaration. This was the Lee Resolution as written by Richard Henry Lee was the authorization for the delegates to sign the Declaration of Independence. A three-step process for declaring independence. Step number one, we are 13 independent sovereign states. When did we sign the Declaration of Independence? July, right? July of 76. This is June of 76. Prior to the Declaration of Independence, the states were already independent states. Now, there's another thing that you have to understand that we're going to address here really, really quickly. That word state to our framers did not mean Missouri, California, Georgia, Florida. It meant Great Britain, Germany, Spain, France. It meant country. We are 13 independent sovereign countries. We are no longer bound to Great Britain. We are independent and sovereign alone. Step number two, as 13 independent newly formed sovereign countries, we must seek alliance with foreign nations to obtain our independence. They were 13 brand new little countries. There is no way they knew by themselves that they would be able to come up with the resources and the materials and the manpower to overthrow the most powerful government in the world. Step number three, as 13 independent sovereign countries who have just now gone into debt with foreign nations and are inviting them to occupy our territories to help facilitate our independence, we must form a confederation. If they did not form a confederation, they would have been immediately occupied and overcome by the very foreign aid that they had received. You don't really think France was helping us because they were just good guys. They were looking to get something out of us. So the states existed prior to the Declaration of Independence. And we have then our first attempt at a constitution called the Articles of Confederation, which did not work out well for us because our framers wanted to create a very small central government. In spite of what you may have heard about the revisionists, there was not a plan to create a large centralized government by even Alexander Hamilton. Small centralized government is what they wanted and they created one so small that it could not run. They had delegated the same powers to that federal government that we delegated to ours. But they did not give the power to levy taxes. And they did not give any power of enforcement of treaties or the uh, power exerted by the central government that was delegated. You see, taxes are necessary. That's the bad news. You cannot run a government without taxes. The problem is corruption in taxes. When you're collecting taxes for the central government to do things they're not authorized to do, that's when you have serious problems. Not only that, if the central government is collecting taxes from the people, that's unconstitutional. The states were supposed to be collecting the taxes from the people and paying the central government because the central government, as you will see in a few minutes, is the employee of the states. Then we get the Constitution of the United States, which is why it's called the more perfect union, because it was our second attempt. George Washington was not the first president of the United States. He was the first president under the more perfect union. I want to read to you this. This is the conclusion to the Declaration of Independence. And it, it verifies to you what I mean about that word state. We therefore, representatives of the United States of America, 
in central congress assembled appealing to the supreme judge of the world for the rectitude of our intentions those nasty atheists in the name and by the authority of good people of these colonies solemnly publish and declare that these united colonies are and of a right ought to be free and independent states that they are absolved from all allegiance to the british crown and that all political connection between them and what is this word right here state of Great Britain is and ought to be totally dissolved and that as free and independent states just like Great Britain look at this power now this confirms to you that they were not talking about Florida, Georgia, or Missouri they were talking about Great Britain, France, and Spain the power to levy war conclude peace contract alliances and establish commerce and they're talking about external commerce, not internal commerce, and do all other acts and things which independent states may of right do. How many of your states understand that they have the power to levy war, conclude peace, uh, contract foreign alliances, and establish foreign commerce? And for the support of this declaration, with firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, fortune, and sacred honor. Now, the liberals love international law, which, by the way, our sovereignty is the sole reason the United Nations hates us. Because the United Nations can go in and take any other country in the world, but they cannot take the United States with one fell swoop because they know we are 50 independent sovereign countries that have come together through a confederation, much to the chagrin of Barack Obama, who calls us a consolidation. This is valid international law. This means that even the United Nations must recognize that every state in the United States is free, sovereign, and independent. Articles of Confederation, our first attempt, Article 2 was the precursor to the Tenth Amendment. Each state retains its sovereignty, freedom, and independence, and every power, jurisdiction, and right. Which, what were those powers, jurisdictions, and right? Levy war? Conclude peace, contract alliances, establish foreign commerce. Not by this confederation, not consolidation, expressly delegated. Now that word delegated is very important. We'll catch that in a second. What is the nature of our republic? The states are united in a compact or a contract. The crazy thing is, every single a lawyer, now you guys know that lawyers are nothing more than law students who have passed the bar, right? And judges are nothing more than lawyers who've gotten a promotion. <coughs> so the sum and total of what your judge knows is based on what his practice of law is and what he learned in law school, and they don't teach the Constitution in law school. They teach constitutional law, which is worse than teaching nothing at all, because constitutional law classes teach that the Constitution, uh, that men and women in black robes know more about the Constitution than the men who wrote it. Which is why you get this living, breathing document lie, which tells you that these men and women in black robes can tell you what the Constitution means regardless of what the founders meant, and it is based on what they believe in that day and that time. But the Constitution is a compact or a contract. Now, a compact is the same thing as a contract, except a compact is a contract between governments, and a contract is a contract between people. So I use those words interchangeably because I'm speaking to laymen. So when I say contract, you have to understand it means compact because the states are governments, little countries, united together. The interesting thing about this, how many of you have heard that the Constitution is a contract between the people and the federal government? Yeah? This is interaction, so we're going to keep talking about this. I'm going to need your feedback. That is a popular misconception. It cannot be a contract between the people and the central government because the central government did not exist until the Constitution was ratified. You
You cannot have the product of the Constitution becoming a party to the Constitution. That is a temporal impossibility. The Constitution is a contract between the states. The Constitution is a contract. The states are a party to that contract, which is important, because as we run through the framers' perspective in this, they are going to several times refer to the Constitution as a, as a compact, or a they'll refer to the states as the parties to that compact. The states created the central government. Is that a stretch? Do we get that at all? <laughs> I don't know. Do you get it? Well, that's why we asked you here, so I was hoping you could make people get it. I'm trying. <laughs> OK, look. The st which, which, which existed first, the central government or the states? states? The states existed in June of 76, right? Prior to the Declaration of Independence. We, the states then got together and created the Constitution in 1787, ratified the Constitution. The Constitution created the federal government, right? Right. So the, con the, the central government is a product of the Constitution. The states are the parties to the Constitution. Since the states created the Constitution, the Constitution created the central government, the states created the central government. Do you see that? Yes. So let, let me ask you that real quickly. So then the states created the central government and surrendered everything over to the big federal government. We're getting there. We're getting there. Right. We're getting there. We're going to do this in small pieces. <laughs> yes. What about the question where, wasn't it referred to the people, though, uh, directly to the people for the people to ratify by their, by their representatives so that it was the contract between the people? That's what I've always thought. Well, you have to understand, oh, I'm not going to do this in 45 minutes. And, so, so listen, the, tenth, the Ninth and Tenth Amendments help explain that, okay? The Ninth and Tenth Amendments are not like one through eight. One through eight are the Declaration of Rights. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments are provisions in contracts called, oh, and the word's just going to come right out of my mouth. Oh my goodness, how did this happen? <clears throat> rules of construction. The Ninth and Tenth Amendments are called rules of construction. In a contract, a rule of construction tells the, the, the reader the, of the contract how to apply every provision within the contract. The Ninth Amendment declares all the rights belong to the people. Okay? Power emanates from rights. Power doesn't exist by itself. It must come from rights. All the rights belong to the people. All the power belongs to the people. But when we enter into governments, we, we delegate certain powers to certain levels of government to achieve a purpose for us. Several times they say we surrender provisions of liberty in order to maintain government. Why do we do that? The Constitution was created to secure the <coughs> blessings of liberty. The Constitution was not created to create a central government. It was created to secure the blessings of liberty. The mechanism we chose to secure the blessings of liberty was a central government from the international perspective. Now the people are the ultimate parties to the contract, but they delegated the contracting authority to the states. So we don't, we are never separated from our states. Can a state exist without its people? It does not have a life on its own. So that's why the Ninth and Ten Amendments are there, is to keep us linked in understanding the source of the power and the fact that all the rights belong.